Welcome back, everybody. I want to put a big shout out again to our gold sponsors, Brown and Caldwell, Corolla, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering Services, Sladen, HDR, Tetra Tech, and Kennedy and Jen Jenks. And of course, our silver sponsor, Stantec. So I'd like to welcome our panel discussion. This is going to be fun. Moderator is Amy Damrell, engineer at HDR. So Amy, take it away. Great, thank you. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome to our panel. Again, I'm Amy Damrell with HDR. Uh, this panel this year is a follow-on to a live panel we had in 2019, um, where we asked um, the panel to provide leadership perspectives um, reflectively in their career, talking about what the future workforce might look like. And this year, we're asking individuals at the beginning of their career to project out that same time frame of 30 or 40 years and um, share their perspectives uh, looking forward in terms of leadership and workforce development. So we're gonna start off with some panel self-introductions. I've asked all the panelists to share a leadership quote if they have one, a favorite leadership quote, and talk a little bit about what motivated them to get into the field. Then we'll move into a few prepared questions we have for them. Um, meanwhile, please chat up any questions you have. Those will come to me and we'll be populating questions asked by the audience um, with our, within our panel. Um, and then last, I've asked the panel to indicate to me if a question comes in they're really excited to talk about. So if you see any like hand gestures or waving, it, it could be for you, but I think most of those gestures are, are coming my way just to make sure I have their, uh, they get my attention and I'm able to direct the questions to them. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get, and get started and I'll just move across the, the screen. So uh, our first panelist is Lorelai. Um, please introduce yourself. Hey everyone, um, my name is Lorelai McVeigh. I uh, am currently the Deputy Director of Utility Operations for the City of Meridian. Uh, so that's the second largest city in Idaho. And uh, we perform drinking water services, wastewater services, and also reclaimed water services. So I've been with the city for about 11 years um, and actually recently just uh, completed my master's degree in public administration. So um, what motivated me to get into this field, it was actually by chance. I had just graduated um, from my undergrad, which was in biology and chemistry. And I was just looking for a job that had some sort of science related element to it. And I got a job by chance in a local wastewater lab. So that's kind of what started my career. And interestingly enough, uh, that made me a third generation water professional. So my, both my dad and my grandpa were in uh, this field. And I think that's what really attracted me to the municipal level, um, seeing the stability that those uh, that job gave them, um, also the work-life balance, and ultimately the ability to retire. Um, so that's kind of what, what brought me into the field. And uh, my, one of my favorite leadership quotes is that leadership is not a position or a title, it is action and example. Great, thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Let's move over to Andrew. Hi, my name is Andrew Matsumoto. I'm an engineer with Civil West Engineering Services down in Albany, Oregon. Uh, most of my work focuses on providing, addressing water quality issues for small communities, mostly in coastal Oregon. Um, I got into the water industry uh, actually by way of being in a singing group. Uh, which I know is probably one of the weirdest ways someone could get into this industry. Um, but I was a, a member of a youth singing group until I was about 18. And after one of the shows, I'd spent some time, you know, sort of sharing with the audience that I was planning to become a civil engineer, uh, was going off to Gonzaga for my undergrad. And one of the audience members turned out to be a an environmental scientist with uh, I think at the time Fleur out at the Hanford site and he on the spot offered me an internship uh, and that turned into pursuing an undergrad degree in civil engineering at Gonzaga going on and doing some graduate work um, and then eventually into my current position with Civil West. And then in terms of a leadership quote, um, one of the ones that I really enjoy is uh, by Warren Buffett, and that's that it takes 20 years to build a reputation, uh, but five minutes to ruin it. Great, thank you. Wise words, appreciate that, Andrew. So Kyle, we'll move over to you with that Gonzaga connection there. 
Hello, I'm uh, Kyle Shimabuku. Um, I'm a currently assistant professor at Gonzaga University in civil engineering. I've been here for a little over a year. So I joined um, you know, a little while after Andrew was attending here. Um, and I got into the field um, because like many people, I kind of liked math and science. And so I thought engineering would be a good fit. Um, and towards the end of my civil engineering degree, I just became aware of the different water crises around the world um, and that people still lack access to safe drinking water. And so I thought um, that would bring a lot of meaning to my, to my work and kind of to my, my skills, trying to solve, work on that type of issue. And so that's kind of how I got into the area of, of water treatment. <clears throat> um, and then as far as a leadership quote, um, one that I like is that, um, uh, I, can't, I can't pronounce the person's name <laughs> who said, said this, but so I'll just read the quote, but they said, uh, when I talk to managers, I get the feeling that they're important, but when I talk to leaders, I get the feeling that I'm important. Great. Thank you very much for that. So our, our fourth and, and final panelist today is Pratista, if you could share. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Pratishta Kansakar. I'm born, I was born and raised in Nepal, so I'm an immigrant. Uh, I'm a water resources engineer by profession, and I've been with BC for the past eight years. I started as an intern and kind of worked my way through grad school a few years ago. Uh, I'm also a mother to a two-year-old, so it's been quite a journey with BC uh, all through these uh, milestones. Um, I'm also a plan engineer. Amy, I'm stealing your word there. Uh, I do hydrologic and hydraulic modeling for uh, different municipalities and potable water, stormwater, and sewer uh, collection systems. Uh, to answer what motivated me to get into this field, I have to share uh, a very uh, pivotal experience uh, in my life. So I've had the luxury to uh, getting access to, you know, numerous mentors along my life. And uh, one of my experience was day two of arriving in the United States. I was given a tour of West Point Treatment Plant, which is one of the uh, key treatment plants here in King County. And that just blew my mind because, you know, I did not know anything about wastewater treatment plants. Uh, and my understanding of um, what civil engineers did uh, was very limited before that. Um, so, and lastly, one of my quotes that I really like about leadership, and I've noticed that a number of previous speakers have kind of resonated the same uh, sentiment is, leadership is the art of giving people a platform for spreading ideas that work. This is by Seth Godin. Uh, and I think a, a big part of flourishing under any leadership is having platforms like this today, like this panel, and I'm very thankful to be part of it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. appreciate that. So I'm going to ask them um, a couple questions we have on and just a reminder to put those any questions you might have for our panelists after you've heard around their background uh, into the box and it'll come my way. So the first um, question is about succession planning and we know there's a lot of retirements planned in the industry with, within the next 10 years. And so how if you could talk a little bit about how your organization um, is preparing for that transition changes you're doing um, and I'll just kind of start off with with Andrew if you want to start with that question. Sure. Um, and so this one's actually a little bit tricky because our company, even though it's been around for 12 years, uh, actually just went through a change in ownership about a year and a half ago. Uh, and those owners are still relatively young. Most are late 40s, early 50s, and have more or less committed to spending an, at least another decade or more with the company. So at the current moment, I'd say they really haven't spent a whole lot of time thinking about succession planning because they're still uh, letting the paint dry on the walls, so to speak. Uh, but I do expect that within the next two to three years, they're going to start sort of envisioning what that transition will look like. And I expect that a lot of their plans will hinge on sort of cultivating and retaining their own staff 
and progressively moving them into positions of more and more leadership within individual offices and then eventually into sort of the ownership group as it exists. Well, it sounds like you just moved through that transition um, really from, from that perspective. And so, um, so thank you. Yeah, it seems like the, the previous leadership thought about that transition and moving it forward and, and that's where you did now, right? Thank yep. you. Yeah. I'd like to add some um, experiences that I've gone through at BC. Uh, we have something called deputy project manager program where, you know, young staffs, rising professionals are getting actively trained to become project managers, become sales leaders. And it's, it's this, uh, you know, program that sets people up for success by training from the bottom up and not expecting someone to take a larger role overnight and succeed in it. Uh, so I think, I think um, that's one of the steps that, that that's going to make a huge difference in having a, a plan um, when people retire. Great, thanks. So, so really on the job training, it sounds like has been pretty important for that. And then Lorelei, I'm interested in your perspective from a public agency, if you are, if you have a, an active plan or how you are approaching it at Meridian. Sure, so um, in our public works organization, a couple of years ago, we did start succession planning and we really, um, since it was the first time we were doing this, we chose to start small. And so we looked and said, what are the really key positions that if these people left and this position was vacant for an amount of time would cause us you know, some organizational challenges. And so we developed that plan and we're really looking at the you know, one to three year window of which staff would be ready to maybe move in that one to three year window. And then recently we started looking at the maybe three to five year window as well. And we maybe don't identify plans for those people yet, but we at least start putting some names in those slots of people that, that may be um, ready. And then we've also implemented in our public works department, a leadership development program that's been really successful. So we um, worked with BSU, the local university here and created this program that we've sent um, a large percentage, I, I think it's, between 60 and 75% of our whole workforce through. So uh, we started with the, the leaders that had, you know, that potential maybe identified in the succession plan, but we've realized that that's been um, successful to open that up to more than just the leaders in the organization and, and start training everybody on those potential future skills. Great, excellent. Thank you for that example. So I'm gonna move on to our second question. I'm gonna start here with, with Kyle, cause I think it, um, you're closest to it maybe, but it talks about college graduates. So college graduates now are more diverse than they were 50 years ago. And what, like, how do you think that we, as an organization, what is their expectation of leadership within organizations and how it's changed and what can organizations to do, do to prepare for, for college graduates and embrace them with their expectations? So I guess your perspective's there. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, the first thing I'll just mention surrounding this is uh, just an emphasis even within um, ABET. So, uh, you know, we're a civil engineering program, and so we're very focused on making sure we achieve all the different criteria so we remain accredited. Um, and so, uh, you know, ABET comments on leadership, um, making sure that uh, our students have, uh, you know, they can uh, function effectively on a team um, and together provide leadership and create a collaborative and inclusive environment. And so I, I think uh, that's where students, <clears throat> particularly when we think about our, the workforce becoming more diverse, um, is they have an expectation, I think more and more, uh, and rightfully so, that their diversity of experiences and their backgrounds should be welcomed. Um, and I, I feel like they also recognize that brings value having uh, more diversity of, of background and experience. And so, you know, an effective leader that would effectively incorporate all of their skills in perspectives should make sure people feel comfortable in being able to speak up and maybe uh, question um, certain assumptions. Um, uh, and feel like, you know, even though um, they may not have all the experience in the world, they may uh, bring um, uh, unique skills uh, that could still be valuable. 
Um, and so I think um, leaders that can effectively make people feel included and like they, they matter um, will be very valuable to the next uh, generation of, uh, of the workforce. Great, thank you. Do any of the other panelists wanna talk about how your organization's embracing diversity and maybe changes you see um, you know, in, within the organizational leadership to improve diversity? So for yeah. two steps, like you. I yeah, I can chime in. And I think Nikki uh, mentioned earlier uh, about scholarships, right? It's one of the things that uh, organizations can do um, readily or more quickly. And, you know, BC has uh, scholarships for minority women, um, LGBTQ. And I think these lay the, the ground for people to start testing different um, industry and different fields and um, welcome diversity. And I've kind of been in the panel in selecting minority scholarships and I'm actually challenging the leadership in considering some of the uh, questions or criteria that's taken into consideration uh, while we select. And I really enjoyed what Nikki and Lee, uh, Rob uh, talked about earlier is, you know, are we, are we, by, by accepting people from um, people who we already know, so by references, are we attracting, you know, same kind of people? And, you know, by saying that we want to hire someone with similar company culture, are we excluding diversity, right? So all these conversations are, uh, have, uh, we're having these conversations through, um, employee network groups and again going back to that platform where we're able to challenge ideas we're able to ch challenge criteria and uh, think through it without you know without being scared that we would be judged for it um, so I, I think that's those are the few steps we've taken to encourage diversity great thank you Loyal or Andrew do either of you want to so one of the things that the city of Meridian recently did, which was a pretty big step, is um, we increased our paid parental leave policy to 12 weeks. Um, and this was a big, a big lift for our organization. Uh, just two years ago, we had no paid parental leave. And so um, we're hopeful that that encourages and brings in um, younger working people, um, encourages that work-life balance, um, and you know maybe allows more women into uh, the organization that would have had to make different choices before that. So that was a, a really big step that our organization just did this last year. Great, thank you. Andrew, did you wanna chime in? Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in and I'll, you know, I'll say that I think this is one of the biggest challenges that our company is currently facing uh, is the, the lack of diversity. And it's, and it's not necessarily for lack of want, it's, it's partially a challenge of where our offices are located. We, are, we aren't located in really large cities that have really diverse populations. We're, we're located in some very rural locations where you know, if, the, if perhaps the, the environment in which our offices are locating isn't necessarily attractive to a diverse population, it can be really hard to recruit. Um, I will say that the, the organization has done a really great job with some prodding recently of doing something very much along the lines of what it sounds like Lorelei has experienced where they've actually instituted uh, some paid parental leave to hopefully make the company more attractive to having a younger workforce, uh, more female staff who would be interested in joining the organization and then staying on um, so that there's, there's not a concern about desire to have children and being able to balance work-life needs from having a family and wanting to have a career. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to another question. Um, so Pratista, you, before joining BNC, you had experience in an NGO. And I'm wondering from that perspective, do you have any kind of um, observations about organizational leadership or approaches in general that could be translated to A and E? Are there any lessons learned that you brought with you or you think others would learn from, from that perspective? Yeah, and just small correction. So I, I was involved in NGO throughout my career at BC. So it was, 
uh, with Living Earth Institute. It's a very small Seattle-based nonprofit organization that does water and sanitation work um, in developing countries, uh, primarily in Nepal. Um, and I was involved uh, actually when I was still in college and it was an amazing opportunity to network, first of all, which is, um, you know, how you, you know, get job and learn and, you know, get work and all of it. So that was uh, the, the major plus point. Uh, the other thing uh, that I really gained from it uh, is because it was water and sanitation, you know, same industry and the people who were interested in volunteering or, you know, contributing were also from the same industry, but from, uh, you know, but this provided a, a different avenue to test leadership skills, test ideas. Um, uh, it, it was a very informal place to uh, share ideas more freely because it was, you know, less pressure and, uh, you know, we weren't uh, going for really large budget projects either. Uh, so I don't think there, uh, the, the leadership structure was definitely different from what we usually experience in our um, day-to-day -day, you know consulting or public sector uh, but it was a great avenue to um, again learn and test skills that I would not have maybe undertaken uh, as an entry-level engineer it it gave me as simple as it gave me opportunities to speak in public um, at, re again related to water and sanitation but just outside of my regular job yeah great Thank you. So this, this question I'll, I'll pass over to Lorelai. So, um, you know, coming up from the lab through operations, do you have, um, like, can you talk a little bit about your leadership journey and, you know, were there specific experiences um, or, or lessons you learned that helped navigate that, that you would share for others? Sure. Um, so I, I really actually value my journey um, moving from sort of the bottom organically up through the organization. I think it's really given me a good perspective. And um, the two things that I would say really uh, helped me through that. The first was um, pretty early on in my career volunteering for the local um, member organization. Um, so our local operator section, um, that really gave me two things. So one, the networking um, aspect, but the other piece um, like Pratisha talked about was the building my confidence and being able to speak in front of groups. And um, doing things that were more than what was required of me at that point. So, you know, that was, that's probably one of the second things is I really would always look for that next thing that I could do to help with. So when I worked in the lab, I would ask, you know, the superintendents at that point, what, what more can I do? What more can I, can I show you that I can do before it was really required of me? And then um, the last thing was, I've been really fortunate to have in my career uh, two male supervisors that have been huge advocates for me. So um, they have spoken well of me to senior leadership. They, um, you know, maybe when executive level leadership doubted that I could move into the next role, they were really huge advocates for me in that. And, and that's been a really important, and I feel really lucky that I had both of them um, to advocate, advocate for me um, in that journey. Great, thank you. All right, so this question's for uh, Andrew. So Andrew, you were the former YP chair for PNCWA and now you're the WEF um, YP liaison, if I've got that right. And um, can you talk a little bit for your perspective, like how you, what you see in the, in the shift from those professional organizations in terms of embracing YPs, embracing diversity and leadership and maybe what we can um, expect from, from that vantage point? Sure, so one of the things that always comes up when I have conversations with uh, friends and colleagues uh, through WEF is that I brag about PNCWA and what I think is the great job that we're doing is sort of promoting the, the youth movement into leadership. Uh, you know, I look, at, I look at our current organization board of directors and uh, it sort of defies the stereotype of an engineering organization that's just a bunch of old gray haired white men. Um, I mean, we've got, uh, you know, I think, I think we've done a very good job of, of at least embracing youth and diversity in our organization's leadership. 
uh, I, and you know, one of the trends that I'm seeing more recently is having that leadership also happen at the committee level. We're seeing young professionals who are not just the chair of the YP committee, they're moving into being chairs of member services committee, vice chairs. Um, I, one of the things that I really look forward to uh, during the next couple of years that I'm on the board is trying to help push YPs into leadership roles of some of the more technical committees. Uh, because one of the things that I think we're, we're all recognizing is that there's going to be a bit of a brain drain in the coming, coming years where folks with a lot of technical experience are going to be retiring. We need to have a workforce that's able to step into those roles. And so having YPs who can move into those leadership roles on our organization's technical committees as well, I think will be really, really valuable and something that I'm going to be pushing hard for over the next couple of years. Great, thank you very much. So just a, a time check for our audience. We have about uh, 10 more minutes. So if there are any questions you have of our panelists, please feel free to chat those in and, and we'll bring those forward. Um, so in terms of, um, this is kind of a question for everybody, but um, like, what do you think is the biggest thing that we could do within our industry to overcome the barriers to diversity? If there's one thing that we could do as, a, as an industry, what would that be to further promote? And so maybe Kyle, I'll start with you. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, helping uh, the future workforce make it easier for them to envision what a career kind of trajectory could look like for them. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think if, if you're interested in recruiting a diverse workforce, you know, the, probably the best thing you can do as a leader is to, to hear where people are, are coming from. So, uh, you know, learn about the things that they're passionate about and, and, um, and think about, you know, is this something that could uh, be meaningful to me over, you know, kind of my long-term career trajectory? Um, you know, and, I, and that's one of the things I tend to be um, always um kind of pleasantly surprised by, I guess you could say, is just, um, you know, all the different reasons why students get into civil engineering um, and then into uh, uh, water and, and environment. Um, you know, sometimes it's because they come from a, a background where they just really care about job security, for instance, but for, for others, they may come into the field because, um, you know, that they have anxiety about, you um, the environment and, and a lack of access to sustainable resources. Um, and so I think listening to what they care about uh, and then describing, you know, why this field could work for them. <laughs> you know, we do have a pretty stable um, uh, job outlook, I would say. Um, and, you know, and like I said, why I got into this field is just because I wanted to feel like I could have meaning in implying kind of technical skills. Um, and so, so again, I, you know, I think just listening to where students are, you know, kind of entry level um, people are coming in and what they care about and then, you know, kind of laying out how they could um, meet those kind of long-term career goals in, in this field. Great, thank you. So I any other panelists share... wanna comment? Oh, sure, yeah, thank you, Patista. Yeah, I can share a very, simple, low hanging fruit that maybe all of you leaders can do who's supervisor or mentor or um, any any um, leadership position. So we just finished Diwali, which is one of the large festivals for Hindus and we're going into Christmas celebration. Um, you know, as simple as acknowledging that not all people celebrate Christmas and you know, people have other big festivals that they prioritize at certain periods of the year. Um, I, when I received like, uh, you know, happy Diwali message from one of my colleague, I was just overjoyed because that's acknowledging diversity and acknowledging that, um, you know, me being different is celebrated. So that's just a quick and easy thing you can do today. Great, thank you for the example. 
appreciate that. So Lorelai, do you wanna comment on what, what are some, some things we can do to advance that diversity? Um, goal. Sure. Um, I think one of the important things, and I know one of the speakers mentioned it, but analyzing that um, that gap between the senior male workers and the women, so both in terms of pay, um, in terms of jobs, and really, you know, when you have the opportunity as a leader or a supervisor to make those hiring decisions to bring people in who have diversity and pay them the same amount as um, you know, their white male coworkers. And I think if your organization can start doing that, you'll retain and keep that diversity. And the more that you can show that in your top leadership, I think it shows the employees in your organization that you value that as an organization and you value um, diversity and changing what, what that top leadership looks like. Great, thank you. Great, another tangible example. Andrew? Yeah, I think my, my recommendation would be to do something as simple as just be an advocate for someone. Um, that, you know, people have advocated for me in my career and I, you know, I would, would hope that I've been a good advocate for uh, some of my coworkers or, or other folks outside of my organization. Um, to just encourage them to take on leadership roles they maybe didn't necessarily think were open to them um, and to let them know to let them know yes this is definitely open to you but then also let the people who are sort of making those decisions know that this person is really valuable and will do a great job in this role uh, so that you make sure that they're actually considered for it. Great, thank you. Um, so kind of leaning off something that Kyle said is kind of helping people sometimes envision their own career trajectory. Um, and I think that's really important, but it is kind of hard when you're starting with that gap. Like how do you show people what the trajectory is like when they don't see somebody in that? So I guess any thoughts on kind of how do you help people envision their trajectory in the water industry, in your organization, um, when you don't have a, an example to kind of show them that they can see? So any kind of thoughts there? All right, I will call on the person who blinks first. Um, so uh, Laurel, I'll kind of look to you for that to start. Um, so that's that's a good question. I think, um, you know, if you don't have that example in your organization, maybe looking towards other organizations um, that, that do have that, or even, you know, even like um, Andrew was mentioning, point them towards PNCWA and show them that, you know, the, the current president of PNCWA is a young woman and that you, you can uh, create that path for yourself. I would say, don't give up, keep trying. And if you find yourself in an organization that's not um, helping employees move forward or not promoting that diversity, then it's, it's probably not the right organization uh, for you. So, um, you know, put in your time, but also keep moving if you're not in the right organization that supports those things. Great, thank you. So kind of, we've got just a couple of minutes to close out, I think on that note, like what advice would you have for somebody I think who's undertaking their leadership journey? Um, so kind of what, what advice would you have for new professionals or us old professionals that still need to learn um, about how to, how to um, kind of continue to drive leadership? So any, any final thoughts, so Batista? Um, yeah, yeah, I can go first. I think having a, a, a person who you can bounce ideas off of, uh, you know, maybe internally, again, you know, a mentor of some sort where um, you can, you can be vulnerable and uh, also ask for really honest feedback, I think is uh, very important in, you know, starting a career, advancing in career, or really just trying any new thing, um, um, within your life. Great, thank you. Kyle? Yeah, just to kind of echo um, that sentiment, you know, I think looking for feedback a lot <laughs> is always the best route to go. So, just, you know, both people towards the end of their career, about how they can be better leaders. I think that's particularly important if it feels like there's a disconnect between the values and the thoughts and the experiences of the incoming um, workforce. Um, and then likewise, if you're at the beginning of your career, being very receptive to feedback and, and seeking that out 
about how you can uh, best be a leader as well is, is always one thing at least I try to work on. Great, thank you. So Andrew, any final thoughts on, on helping people through their leadership journey? Yeah, I think my thoughts are going to echo what we've heard from, from Kyle and Pratista is that it, it really boils down to either if you're, if you're a young professional finding a mentor and if you are a more seasoned professional being willing to be a mentor for someone, uh, you know, I have, I have mentors inside of my organization, but I also have I've leveraged the, the mentorship resources outside of my organization through PNCWA to be able to have sort of those, those difficult conversations that you maybe can't have with someone who is your direct supervisor, um, but who has sort of blazed that trail in a different organization and can sort of share how they have either succeeded with that or maybe not succeeded and what pitfalls you might want to avoid in your career. And so certainly I would advocate for everyone to, to certainly find a mentor and if you can be a mentor to someone else. Great, thank you. I'll just add one more thing. I think I would encourage people to put them in uncomfortable situations so that you can challenge yourself uh, and grow. I think uh, that's, that's the best way to move forward. Great, thank you. So Lorelai, last, last opportunity for just a few seconds on kind of your final thoughts on driving leadership and challenging ourselves to be good leaders. And I would, I would agree with what uh, Pratisha said that it's put yourself out there. Um, it's gonna feel uncomfortable. It's gonna be challenging. Um, but you know, some of my biggest advances was stepping into roles that I, I didn't know a whole lot about um, when I became the maintenance manager about wastewater maintenance, but put yourself in those positions, learn about it, show people that you can do it and keep building your skill set. Great. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. I think we heard some really good examples, tangible examples on what we can do to continue to promote leadership, diversity, and inclusion in our organizations. So thank you for being vulnerable and um, challenging or, or maybe not challenging yourself to, to be here with us today. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. So with that, I have the pleasure of introducing um, Mark Poling, and he is going to be giving us our final thoughts. So Mark is currently the um, Strategic Business Associate at Clean Water Services, which is a, a new role in his semi-retirement. Um, he'd been at Clean Water Services for 24 years. Um, prior to that, he was at King County, um, and he also has a, a Class 4 Operator Certificate. So Mark's taken on a lot of leadership roles in his career. He's been the, on the WEF Board of Trustees. He's been a PNCWA past president. He uh, was the first Leadership Development Committee chair, and he was part of the group that got the charter going for that committee. So really the origins of this, this committee stem from Mark. Um, but in addition to the roles, one thing that I just really appreciate about Mark is he has such an unwavering passion for supporting people in their own leadership journey. So he's just great at support, at mentoring, at gentle prodding um, to really get people to challenge themselves. And you know, I've been the recipient, a uh, fortunate recipient of some of Mark's coaching on the leadership side. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark who will um, give us some final thoughts for today. Mark. Well, th thank you, Amy, for that introduction. It's really been my it's been my pleasure to, um, to to work with you and with so many other people in the PNCWA, and throughout my and throughout my uh, leadership journey. Uh, I think today we've heard some just some some great information. I'm not to tell you the truth. I'm I'm kind of humbled to be part of this group because these people have taken chances in their careers. They've had the courage and and the vulnerability to step out and do things. Um, we've heard things about uh, uh, how there needs to be more than one voice in, in advocating for, for greater diversity, for greater equity and inclusion. Uh, we talked about how equity is a journey. And that's absolutely true because every leadership journey, every leadership er, er, person's trying to become leaders. It's a journey. It's definitely not, it's not a straight line by any means. Um, and you know, if, you, if we run into each other, I would love to hear about your leadership journey. Um, there's vulnerability. 
And this idea of, you know, you need to be kind to others as well and, and be kind to yourself. And that's one of the things I really liked about the, one of the panelists said is they um, said, you know, give yourself a break because you're not going to be perfect at a lot of these things. Uh, the other, other part I liked about this is all of the resources that are out there for people to take a look at and to, uh, to really learn more on this. I'm going to close just with a couple minutes about my own journey. So just so you know, I'm, I'm really tall in case you, we've never met. Um, I'm pretty close to seven feet tall. I stand out a lot. And that's not always an easy thing when you're a shy person. And I'm, I have to fight that oftentimes about being shy. And the funny part is, especially when you're going through middle school, when you're like six foot four and you're 13 years old, you don't want to stand out. And yet there you are. And so you, you become a bit of an object, whether you want to be or not. And so it, it's, it's not easy all the time, right? It's not easy. And I remember in junior high, at one point, um, I was applying for the uh, uh, Junior National Honor Society. And so I had to go around to a number of teachers and they uh, marked you on different areas. And, and one of the areas was leadership. And I was, I got really good marks from all of my teachers, except in the leadership area. And, and it surprised me, but yet I think it was that shyness that really prevented me from stepping out and from really expressing my thoughts and from really trying to be more authentic. And as I went through school, uh, we changed, uh, we changed locations, we moved. I went to a new school in the middle, in the middle of uh, junior high school. And that was really, again, really tough for a shy person who can't fade into the background <laughs> at all in any setting. It, it was a really difficult time for me. And then I remember when I went to college and I'll never forget this weekend because I went there and no one, hardly not anyone asked me about being tall. It was the weirdest thing. I, I get those questions now. I'm, you know, I, even at my age, I still just get these questions about being tall, always kind of being singled out. People just want to know about me. That was an amazing experience. And that was part of acceptance. And, and in my mind, that's, that's a bit of leadership, isn't it? When we, when we just reach out to people to try and find out who they are and to really help bring them out, it, it's just an amazing thing. It, that, that act of kindness was, was really, really, uh, I still to this day, it really touches me. Uh, so what I'm going to encourage you today is to think about someone that you can perform an act of kindness to. And this may be a person that, you know, you don't have that much contact with, but perhaps you notice in the last virtual meeting that there's just something not right. Reach out to them, perform that act of kindness, ask how they are doing. Is, is there something going on at home? Are they having some struggles with balancing all these different things in this virtual world and in the pandemic? Have they had some uh, personal issues going on with loss or something like that? Those acts of kindness, are what we need today in this world. Those are the kinds of leadership acts we need to, to perform every single day. So again, my encouragement to you is to, to reach out, to perform that act of kindness and to really spread this and make this leadership movement really take off. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Karen. Karen, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Mark, thank you. And it was really hard to, you know, make sure we, we wanted to give you a lot more time. So I'm so grateful that we had this amount of time with you. So thank you. And thank you to all our speakers. We're not done yet. The speakers are all waiting for you in the networking sessions. So please don't leave. Um, they're at your beck and call to answer some questions. So, so as I wrap up just this um, part of the presentation, um, just want to remember PNCWA is a great family. I've been a member along with Mark for many years and we'd love to have you join us at the very least the leadership development committee and with that i'd like to say thank you i'll leave you with two things uh remember be comfortable with being uncomfortable and as we heard from mark be kind so we'll see you in a little bit in the zoom rooms thanks everyone